All right. <laughs> right. Has the welcome. Yeah, I want to welcome people as you come into the to the Zoom. We're going to wait a few minutes while everybody comes on in, and then we'll get started. Must be some Jackson Pollock fans out there. This is a very good sized group. Yes. <laughs> it's, well, we have a, a shared um, group of people coming from a few different libraries, and some people are coming, I think, from other parts of the country. Awesome. The beauty of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Maryland. Wow. This is great. Well, I mean, we might as well get started, I think. So from the Chelmsford Public Library, we wanna welcome Jane O'Neill and she has quite a, a talk ready for us tonight. And we're gonna learn about one of our, one of my favorites, I should say, Jackson Pollock. So without further ado, welcome Jane. Thanks so much, Joan. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We're in for a treat, um, but I wanted to start off by actually congratulating you for being here tonight. And I love the information that's coming in about where everybody's from. Please feel free to share that because I always get um, just joy seeing seeing how we brought people together for this. So um, I wanted to start off, like I said, by congratulating you for being here because I think Jackson Pollock can be really challenging for a lot of people. So whether you love his art, whether you hate it, whether you're skeptical or just curious, again, thank you for being here. You're doing something wonderful. Tonight, I hope to uh, enhance your appreciation for Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner's abstract expressionist art. We will be getting back to this wonderful image that we just see a little detail of on the screen a little later. But what I thought I would do was um, just to start with a quick preamble, a little visual preamble to get us started on um, thinking about where Jackson Pollock's work is kind of placed in the history of art. And this is going to be very brief, but um, in very broad brushstrokes in general terms, if we go back thinking to like the Italian Renaissance, the 1400s, we have artists like the one over here on the left who is trying their hardest to create a painting that looks like a window onto the world. He's giving his figures a mass, there's um, highlights and shading, but in particular with this work, this wonderful sense of perspective that leads our eye back to the little tree in the distance. So you feel like, you know, maybe you could reach into the picture, maybe you could walk into the picture. The picture feels like a very extension of our lives. And this holds true for the next 600 years or so. And then along comes Picasso so at the beginning of the 20th century, and he breaks all of those rules. I mean, they were kind of broken here and there along the way, but in general terms, Picasso is the one that breaks them. And over here, we can see his portrait of a girl. Um, you're gonna have to trust me that that's what that is <laughs> from um, right around 1910, where, um, where he is breaking down the forms. He's flattening the figure. I always compare it to taking your Amazon boxes and collapsing them to go into the recycling. But I want you, I want to draw attention to the fact that he has reduced his color palette. Um, there are no more like bright reds or, or these rich blues that we see over here. It's really just grays, tans, whites, blacks. And then in addition to that, he's, um, He's sort of disorienting us because he's using shading and highlighting in illogical, almost nonsensical ways here. So, um, so he is he's fighting back against this notion of a picture being a window onto a world because if this is the world, it doesn't make any sense to us, right? So Picasso breaks the rules and he opens doors for other artists, artists like Mondrian over here on the left or, um, or, or Miro over here on the right, artists um, who can now simply uh, uh, paint what their heart desires. That might be uh, um, just a, a geometric abstraction, these pure 
fields of, of, um, of simple colors, you know, primary colors here, the red, the blue, the yellow, or it might be something like Miro over here where he's just creating these delicate little biomorphic forms that seem to hang right there on the surface of the picture plane. Again, neither one of these artists are attempting to create that illusion onto another world. By the 1940s, there are actually several artists that are doing drip paintings that we associate primarily with Jackson Pollock. I think you might be interested to know that other artists were doing it first. This is a painting by Hans Hoffmann we'll, uh, over here on the left. We'll hear a little bit more about him as the night goes on. But over on the right is a drip painting by a woman artist named Janet Sabel. And you might not have heard her name before, but believe it or not, Jackson Pollock actually credited his inspiration for drip paintings, but on, on Janet Savelle's work, he saw her do it first. We talk about not getting credit for where credit is due, but it this all leads up to the idea that by the time we get to Jackson Pollock, right around mid-century, there's a sense of inevitability here. There's this idea that artists have been moving away from this attempt at creating this illusion. I should mention too that we're looking at Pollock's painting called Autumn Rhythm or Number 50 from 1950. And what we see here, it feels like the culmination of um, this trend towards flatness in the 20th century. Now, critics championed this as pure painting. It's, um, it's an artist using the basic materials of painting and not trying to create the illusion that it's anything but that. It's a flat canvas, it's viscous paint. We see it all coming together here. So they championed that. Um, and now, well, there are no historical references as we look at a, 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 at a non-objective painting like this. What, what is true about Jackson Pollock's paintings is that they do seem to be of their time. This is um, seemingly in response to the chaos and violence of World War II, um, as well as to the, to the speed and frenetic energy of modern life. So Jackson Pollock, this work is considered abstract expressionist. So instead of painting recognizable objects in our daily lives, he is expressing his feelings, expressing something about himself as he painted this using color and line. And that is essentially the essence of abstract expressionism. It's about a mood. It's about a frame of mind. We take this for granted to a certain extent when we look at art today. We imagine that it is in some way a representation of the artist as much of it as much as it may be a representation of something else. But Pollock sort of opens the door for that. So he becomes a part of the fabric of American life. And um, so much so that we have somebody like Norman Rockwell who's creating his own Jackson Pollock inspired painting. Don't take my word for it. Look here, he's actually included a J and a very recognizable P in this splatter painting here. This is Rockwell's cover for the Saturday Evening Post in 1962, and it's called The Connoisseur. So this is more than a decade after, after um, Pollock makes a splash, literally, but we can see that Rockwell, and by extension, the rest of America, is still coming to terms with this, still trying to understand it. So we see a, sort of an old school notion of what an art connoisseur might look like, and we project ourselves into his body because we can see him from behind. And he is up close, staring intimately at this very large abstract expressionist work, um, more colorful than, than a typical Pollock, I would say. But he gives us the opportunity every Every single one of us looking at this at this work to kind of check in with how we feel about this style of painting. Maybe you think that there's some beauty in it. Maybe you think, oh God, it just seems too easy to create. Where's the talent? But basically Rockwell allows us, gives us the opportunity to become the connoisseur in that moment. So other ways we see um, Pollock coming into the fabric of American life. Well, he's sort of the butt of so many jokes and cartoons. Here we have Jackson Pollock's birthday. He's blowing out the candles and it makes one of his paintings on the walls. Over here, he's signing a rent check and he's just throwing the ink around and hoping that suffices for a signature. Now, um, there are two kind of ideas that are oftentimes interlaced with Pollock references. And the first idea is very simple. It's questioning 
um, the, the talent involved in creating a Pollock painting. I'm sure we've all heard the phrase, my kid could paint that. As somebody who's worked in several art museums, I can attest to the fact that on most tours, there was always someone who said, my kid could paint that. And I love this cartoon over here on the left because the cartoonist has sort of answered that, that familiar quip uh, by painting a child-sized Jackson Pollock. So it's sort of saying, yeah, your kid could paint that if your kid is Jackson Pollock. And then over here on the right, this other big idea that's sort of interlaced with everything when it comes to Jackson Pollock is, um, is this notion, this incredulity around the value of his painting. So this is um, this is a movie called Who the Bleep is Jackson Pollock? It came out in the early 2000s and it follows the story of this truck driver who bought a, a splatter painting, a drip painting uh, at uh, I think it was a yard sale and then goes on to try and pr prove, uh, authenticate this painting that, 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 um, that could be worth, you know, tens of millions of dollars. So, so we all kind of marvel at this notion that something that seems so easy to create could be valued so much. And I think it's hard for most people to kind of reconcile. So we'll dive into all of this tonight. Uh, let me give you a sense of how we'll spend the rest of the hour together. We're going to get started on Jackson Pollock's early years and then sort of see how he goes from um, young art student essentially to internationally renowned. And then we'll uh, wrap up with his death and legacy, turn our attention over to Lee Krasner, who was married to Jackson Pollock, uh, consider her work sort of in the shadow uh, of his kind of larger than life persona during the 1940s and 50s. And then um, and then think about her, um, her career following his death and as well as her death and legacy. So lots to cover. Um, and I should mention that all of these title slides have images that we'll circle back to too. So let's get started with Pollock's early years. He was born Paul Jackson Pollock in Cody, Wyoming in 1912. He was the youngest of five boys. Here he is as a little guy um, in a formal family portrait, uh, although don't let the formality of that portrait fool you. They had no money and they were very dysfunctional. And the, uh, it was a very rough upbringing for him. His father abandoned the family when he was, uh, when Pollock was just a teenager. So he had behavioral issues almost his entire life. We can see him over here as a 16-year-old. He's um, and, and I should mention his family moved away from Wyoming when he was about 10 months old. And for the most part, they were living in California. He and all of his brothers shared an interest and an inclination towards the arts. And around the time of this photograph, Pollock had uh, been attending an arts high school. It was one of many schools that he would get kicked out of. So uh, lots of behavioral stuff, lots of emotional things. If um, if he were alive today, he'd probably have some sort of mental illness diagnosis, probably something like bipolar, but of course we can't diagnose him uh, posthumously. So while he was a teenager, he also spent some time um, traveling, hiking, and actually assisting with surveying around the Grand Canyon. These are actually Pollock family photographs. Art historians love this sort of thing because it, it almost seems like it is the foundation for Pollock's love of kind of wide open vistas. Does staring at the Grand Canyon when you're 15 years old mean you're going to make big drip paintings later on? Maybe you could draw that line. But one thing we do know that was happening during this time is that he was introduced to alcohol, which uh, was probably the worst thing that he could have started doing um, What with his mental health uh, challenges at that stage. Um, already. So he continues on, life is not easy. This is actually a self-portrait that he painted when he was just 20 years old. And I think any one of us would be fairly alarmed if um, if somebody we knew in our lives painted a self-portrait that looked like this. As a young man, Pollock wrote, people have always frightened and bored me. Consequently, consequently, I have been within my own shell. So he is somebody who was struggling in so many ways and his brothers would always kind of come to his rescue and, um, and bail him out and, and sacrifice something on their own behalf to kind of prop him up. So it's not totally surprising that Pollock 
would move across the country to New York City with one of his brothers so that they could both study art together. And they started studying art underneath the artist Thomas Hart Benton, who we can see over here on the left. And on the right is an example of the kinds of painting, paintings that Benton was making um, in the early 1930s. So this is the kind of work that Pollock would have seen while he was there studying with him. Now, what we're looking at are fairly realistic paintings. Uh, these are known as American scene paintings. And oftentimes they make heroes out of the uh, everyday laborers that you would see if you're traveling around America. This is a work called Cotton Pickers from about 1928. And uh, Thomas Hart Benton had this way of kind of uh, elongating figures and adding these kind of uh, a wonderfully uh, undulating lines to their to their forms that that just seems so incredibly expressive. Now, Jackson Pollock would argue that he didn't learn anything from Thomas Hart Benton, only what he wanted to uh, respond against, uh, only what he didn't want to do. But I will challenge that. Look at this. This is what Jackson Pollock was painting around the same time. Um, this is also called cotton pickers. Now. Uh, as he moves to New York City, as he's establish, uh, establishing with Thomas Hart Benton, he drops the Paul as his first name. He starts going by Jackson. And he also, in the midst of the Great Depress Depression, gets um, tied in with New Deal programming to, that helps to support artists. So like the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, the FAP, the Federal Art Project. And so now for the first time in his adult life, he's got some financial security and he's got the support of his brother. But other things are happening in the 1930s too. He's being exposed to some experimental art making, namely in the form of the artwork being produced by the celebrated Mexican muralists. He meets Diego Rivera, and here is Jackson Pollock with David Siqueiros. And he actually worked in Siqueiros's uh, workshop studio in New York City um, for an extended amount of time. And there was a, a lot of experimental stuff happening. This is an example of Sikiros's work. And he said, um, Sikiros said that revolutionary art required new materials. A paintbrush is an implement of hair and wood in an age of steel. So he was encouraging the students in his workshop to um, fling <laughs> paint, to use airbrushing and stenciling, um, use automobile lacquer, use paint thinner. So uh, all sorts of, of unusual wild things for the day were happening there. And it, it no doubt kind of opened up doors for, for uh, uh, Jackson Pollock at the time. Now, during the 1930s, he also got the chance to go to the Museum of Modern Art and see a retrospective of Pablo Picasso. So all of Picasso's work since uh, 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 culminating with 1937's Guernica, this uh, epic post or uh, anti-war image that um, that was painted in response to the Nazi bombing of, of a Spanish town. Now, Pollock was absolutely captivated by this image. He filled notebooks with sketches of this image. And he once famously said about Picasso, that bastard misses nothing. So there is a lot about Picasso that inspired Jackson Pollock. And I think some of these drawings, some of the, or some of the um, imagery that, that you can see here in Guernica sort of finds its way into Pollock's drawings. He also saw another show at the Museum of Modern Art on Native American art. He also saw um, a demonstration of Native Americans painting with sand on the ground, which would seem to have a big influence on him uh, later on in life. Now, all of this wonderful stuff is happening. It seems like it's building so organically to the famous splatter paintings, but let's also remember that he was incredibly disturbed and incredibly addicted to alcohol during this time. So he was, as, as World War II starts ramping up, he's determined to be unfit for military service because of his mental health and his alcohol addiction. He does um, see two different analysts during the course of his life, and he's involved in Jungian analysis. And we won't go deep into that, but I will say these analysts both used Jackson Pollock's drawings as part of their analysis. So these are the types of images that he would create and then sort of go and examine while he was um, uh, visiting his therapist. And to me, they, they seem like they borrowed a lot from Picasso right there. 
So he's struggling, things are, are, are not quite lining up for him. And then he is fortunate enough to meet Lee Krasner, his future wife. They uh, happened to both be exhibiting at the Macmillan Gallery when the show ended. She famously showed up unannounced at Jackson Pollock's apartment because she wanted to meet the, the artist who had created the work that she was so interested in. Um, she was uh, extremely intrigued, I should say, by abstract impressionism. Uh, he wasn't quite there yet, but we're going to see that she kind of follows it along. So um, within the course of three years, they are married and Lee Krasner provides um, the second most important <laughs> stability that he's encountered until this point in his life. And she encourages him to continue painting and, um, and, and he is incredibly productive with her care and support. Now, sadly, Lee Krasner would go on to, to one day say that Jackson Pollock was never happy the entire time she knew him. So there is this kind of tragedy in all of the pictures of him and in the story of his life. So what was he producing around this time? Um, he was creating still figurative images in the early 1940s in the midst of World War II. They all seem to have references to women. Uh, there's a lot of art historians that get into his relationship with his mother. This one is called Birth, definitely looks pretty violent. Um, over here on the right, we have She-Wolf, sort of like a, a reference to the founding of, of the city of Rome. But these are early 1940s works and they're abstracted. Certainly there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of power to these images. They seem really raw. And in fact, that's why critics of the day and curators particularly loved them. Um, uh, uh, the curator of Pollock's first solo show wrote, Pollock's talent is volcanic, it's fire, it's unpredictable, it's undisciplined, it's lavish, explosive, untidy. What we need is more young men who paint from inner impulsion without an ear to what the critic or the spectator say. So these are, are raw works that certainly seem to be of their time. Now, this next image here, is a turning point in Pollock's career. After this piece, he completely abandons figuration in his works um, to wholeheartedly embrace abstract expressionism. So the year is 1943. This is a commission for Peggy Guggenheim, who was an art collector and a gallerist. And she wanted this monumental canvas for the entryway of her brownstone in New York City. And so um, the resulting work is simply called Mural. And, um, and the work is dominated by these large arabesques, these, these black lines that to me always almost seem like musical notes that kind of dance across the surface of this canvas. And then he uses these colors like the greens, the pinks, a little bit of yellow to go back in and accent and punctuate those arabesques. And I think what's so interesting about this work in particular is that the more time you spend with it, the more you see these kind of variations, these deviants, uh, these deviations, I should say, away from the larger rhythm of the work. And those deviations are in and of themselves just fascinating, but they never break the overall effect. They invite you to come in closer and to find more of them, but, um, but they are just that, just little deviations here. Now there's a wonderful myth about this painting. Here we see the artist with his work looking so defeated, right? Look at his bunched shoulders. Now, this is a 19 foot long canvas that he painted upright and he had it in his apartment in New York City. Now, he didn't have a room that was big enough to house this canvas. So he actually broke down walls in his own apartment to just uh, satisfy the, the, um, the dimensions of this canvas. And according to Lee Krasner, he stared at this blank canvas for weeks, if not months, and he was just paralyzed by his anxiety at this entire project. Now there's the beautiful myth that it was the night before that he just started working, night before the deadline, I should say, and he just starts putting paint on canvas and, and the whole thing kind of comes together in a single evening. It's a wonderful story, isn't it? 
So in the end, we have this, this incredible work um, that, that some people were really enthralled by. Other critics kind of panned it. They, they called it exalted wallpaper. I mean, here he is um, abandoning figuration. What are we really looking at? I mean, is it just purely decoration? But Pollock said, there was a reviewer who wrote that my pictures didn't have any beginning or any end. He didn't mean it as a compliment, but it was. And I think what he's really referring to is the idea that a work like this pulls you in. It's bigger than you, it has no end, and you can sort of feel like you can inhabit it or at least spend all this time appreciating all of those, well, the overall rhythm and then all of those little deviations within it. Now, here is a photograph of Pollock with Peggy Guggenheim in front of the mural. There is another myth that perhaps they had a little romantic relationship or sexual relationship around the time of the mural, but there are confirmed reports that Pollock urinated in her fireplace in the middle of a cocktail party following the completion of the mural. So that gives you a sense in terms of what kind of an alcoholic he was. So um, with Peggy Guggenheim's money, with a, I think it was $2,000 that she paid him for this and then another $3,000 loan on top of that, he and Lee Krasner were able to get married and buy this house on the far side of Long Island in a little town called Springs, New York. So $5,000 house, all Peggy Guggenheim money, I believe. And um, it looks like a pretty decent house, right? But it had no central heat and it also had no indoor plumbing. So they, they were kind of roughing it out there. But it's this is the location where, um, where, where Pollock begins to thrive. And in part, it's because Lee Krasner has finally gotten him away from his drinking buddies. And, um, and, and he is, he's, he's, he becomes sober as we'll learn. And, uh, and Lee Krasner is on a mission really to save him from himself. So let's, uh, Let's turn our attention now to what proves to be a turning point in Pollock's career. I just want to quickly remind us with some brutal images here that we are right on the heels of World War II when this happens. Pollock and Krasner get married literally, I, I think, within a month or two of the war ending and then move out to Long Island a, a month or two later. So this is all immediate. So we have this sense that um, with the end of World War II, uh, that the world has witnessed unfathomable violence and atrocity and the world has forever changed. Um, nothing, everything's moving faster, the news, communications, all of it. And America is now the leader in the world, politically and militarily. And, um, and what will happen with Pollock working out on Long Island is that for the first time ever, America will take a leading role in the art world as well. This has never happened. Um, America's always been sort of subservient to Europe when it comes to arts and culture. And something happens in this little barn out in Springs, New York. So um, uh, on their property, there was this like ramshackle barn. Uh, Jackson Paul cleans it out and that is his studio. And here he is following Lee Krasner into the barn. And beginning in 1946, he, he's painting uh, works that are almost at first figurative. And then he spends all this time really obscuring the image. This is what he's producing in that barn. Um, so we have maybe the effects of moving away from the city to something that is to a place that is a little bit more rural. We see a little bit more light and color, at least at first. Uh, what's really interesting to me is how he becomes almost obsessed with obscuring the image. At first, he's kind of doing it by squeezing paint out of a tube and then using a little knife to smear it around. Then he's getting his fingers right in there. And the paintings become kind of fun to try and um, try and kind of see through. You can almost imagine this, um, this veiling of the image as being just that, a veil that you can partially see through and kind of make sense of, of the original painting that is there underneath it. So uh, these two works, uh, on the left, we have the shimmering substance and on the right, eyes in the heat. Um, and it does sort of seem like there might be a few eyes in there. And what we'll see in a little while, in just the space of a year or two, is that Pollock uh, gives up 
naming his works and he instead just chooses to number them because when you give it a name people are always looking for that thing in in the works also that's what a lot of uh musical composers do they just number their work and Paul loved jazz probably not surprisingly <laughs> so um so it seemed like another way another point of reference for people to understand his paintings so by the next year 1947 he is beginning to drip and drizzle paint onto his canvases so they're not entirely drip paintings per se but once again he's creating this thin veil on top of them and he didn't even really know what he was doing as he got started with this he actually brought one of these paintings back into the house back to Lee Krasner and he asked her is this a painting I mean what a question to ask right he um he I think he sensed he was on the cusp of something on the left we have a painting called the galaxy which makes great sense we've got this sort of silver um um uh, a tone to to the picture it almost feels like it's a spaceship in some way and then on the right we have the reflection of the big dipper almost like a a nod to the night sky uh, I will say that this is uh, around the time when we can link back to that other artist who had been doing some drip paintings before him. That artist's name was Hans Hoffman, if you remember. And Lee Krasner had reconnected uh, or connected Pollock with Hans Hoffman. And Hoffman said, you know what, you need to stay closer to nature. You're kind of going off too far on your own thing. Stay closer to nature. Let nature be your guide and your inspiration. And, um, and Pollock famously responds with, I am nature. And so we'll, we'll kind of dive into that, what that means. But of course, uh, at, at that moment, I mean, it, it's this idea that what's coming from me is just as valuable um, and just as intriguing as me, you know, looking at, at, at a forest setting or something like that. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to the drip paintings proper. In 1947, Pollock begins to consistently paint on unstretched canvases on the floor. That means they're not in a, a, a frame. They're not like stapled to the edges of a wooden frame. These are, of course, his signature paintings. And he's moving around the paintings, all four sides. He's dripping, he's flinging, he's drizzling, and he's almost dancing the paint onto the canvas. He is, well, he starts off using brushes and sometimes turkey basters, but then he ends up kind of thinning out the paint in the cans and primarily using sticks to drizzle the paint and make these dramatic swirling patterns on the ground. So his gesture is transferred to the canvas by way of this flying paint. Pollock described these works as energy and motion made visible. The critics called it action painting. And action painting is just feeds into this notion that Jackson Pollock was like this cowboy. He was this tough guy. He certainly was different from generations of more kind of effeminate, maybe more uh, traditionally uh, uh, emotional figures that had been um, tied to the art world. He was a different kind of superstar for the art world. Now, what he's doing might seem sort of random. It might seem accidental, maybe wild, maybe even a little bit careless, but there is or was remarkable control in terms of how Pollock created a painting. We're gonna look back at Autumn Rhythm one more time here. This is at the Met Museum. And I'm going to kind of walk you through how he made this painting or maybe ha maybe a fun way to appreciate these paintings because we're going to just focus our eyes on a single color at a time and imagine how he laid that paint on, how quickly we can even imagine. Was he walking swiftly around the edges of the canvas to lay in these rather thin um, little skeins of, of white paint here? You can sort of get a sense of what those gestures look like. And they seem to be kind of curvilinear, right? But now let's turn our attention to this kind of beige tan and notice how rectilinear those are. Those almost seem like jagged knife edges in comparison. And then you have, and I'm not even sure which color he put in first. That's a, that's a whole other kind of fun decoding piece to a Jackson Pollock. But you have all of the calligraphic black lines here too that are not just black lines, but also little dribbles of paint. And they 
they appear sort of consistently throughout. It's not like it's all clustered in one corner and then kind of falls apart in the rest of the picture. There's a, there's an overall effect to the painting itself. There's something really satisfying. Um, and like I said, Pollock was numbering his paintings at this point. He said, if people would just look at the paintings, I don't think they would have any trouble enjoying them. It's like looking at a bed of flowers. You don't tear your hair out over what it means. Now, if we focus on this notion of the control involved in creating a work of art, there are <laughs> researchers that have connected Pollock's paintings to geometric fractals. Now, I am not an expert in fractals at all, but here's a simple way to explain the notion of a fractal. It's the idea, and fractals exist in nature, so we're looking at a little tree here, that, um, that a shape in nature uh, occurs and then replicate smaller and smaller and smaller and so on and so on. So um, there, it has been determined that there are fractals in Jackson Pollock's paintings. And believe it or not, fractals are used to authenticate his paintings with 93% accuracy. So that means there's an incredible amount of control in a work like this one. Once again, I can't tell you where the fractals are, unfortunately. But um, what's even more amazing is that neuroscientists have determined that we as human beings feel the same sense of peace, calm, and stress reduction when looking at a Jackson Pollock painting as we do when we're looking at naturally occurring fractals, i.e. the outdoors. So there's something downright exquisite happening with these paintings that's really sort of beyond what we understand. Now, uh, that being said, they are filled with a number of accidents. This is an up close shot of one of his paintings. And you can find all sorts of things in his paintings. You can find buttons and cigarette butts and strings and sticks and thumbnails and tacks and coins and even a key in one of his paintings. This kind of looks like a boot print to me, but but there's stuff in there. And, it, and for the most part, it seems accidental, although he does have one painting called Convergence with a matchstick right in the center. So uh, I was watching an, an old documentary that is on YouTube, if you're so interested, about Jackson Pollock. I believe this one's from the 70s. And there was a story from like the mechanic out there in Springs, uh, New York, who talked about going and visiting Pollock in his studio. And Pollock would be like rip roaring drunk and uh, break a beer bottle, step on it, his feet are bleeding, and he'd be like walking on his canvases. Now that could be apocryphal, we don't know. I've never seen a bloody canvas before. But not surprisingly, Pollock gets sober. This is how he becomes productive. So from 1948 to 1950, he is sober and that is his burst of productivity, his burst of creativity. And that's when he's producing his very best work. So we begin to um, see these wonderful drip paintings and we see a lot of these images too because um, I think not since this, this notion that Michelangelo might've painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling lying down on his back, that didn't happen. Not since then has there been such a fas fascination with the way a painting has been made. So these photographs of Pollock at work, I think, are part and parcel to understanding his paintings. Um, needless to say, they weren't sketched out ahead of time. They weren't pre-planned. They are spontaneous. They lean into the accidental. Um, he was not the first artist to ever put a canvas on the floor. There's a whole tradition in Asian art making um, that, that came before him, but still this approach seems revolutionary. And, um, and this approach allowed him to paint from all sides. It's interesting that from there, we put it up on the wall and we look at it from one angle. So um, so a few more of these images of him at work. It's hard not to think about this as a sort of dance. You can almost, I, I just love this image with his legs kind of crossed, almost like a, 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 a ballet dancer on, in this image on the right. There's something really graceful about this. He's conjuring these paintings with these gestures and what he's really doing is kind of painting in the air and the and the resulting painting is the um is is the the total effect of this dance that he is doing. So um 
so if anybody's curious, all of these photographs were, um, were almost all of these photographs were, were done by one photographer who was hired to go out there and kind of document him at work. We'll kind of circle back to that in just a moment. But everything sort of culminates for Jackson Pollock in 1949 when he's featured in Life magazine with the title, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? That's pretty provocative, right? Here he is looking for all the world, like such a tough guy. And he's so closed off, arms crossed, legs crossed, smoking a cigarette. He is a man's man. They go back to this idea about being a cowboy. There's a preeminent art critic at the time who likens Jackson Pollock's throwing paint to the precision of a cowboy with a lasso. So um, this is as manly as it can get. Now, the, the question here from Life Magazine is so provocative. It's almost like Norman Rockwell and, and his Saturday Evening Post uh, cover. It prompts us all to think, you know, I could do this, my kid could do this. Is there any value in this? I, I don't see it, maybe I do. But I will say, uh, for the most part, I, I think people, uh, were, were skeptical and they drew associations sometimes unconsciously, sometimes explicitly with the spillage of bodily fluid kind of takes us back to norm to uh, I'm sorry Jackson Pollock urinating everywhere. Um, but I, I'll, I'll share with you this quick story. Uh, sometimes Pollock's own words would support the reading that there's uh, something about this that's kind of connected to bodily fluids. When a woman asked him, how do you know when you're finished with a painting? Pollock replied, how do you know when you're finished making love? So there you have it. Um, so Pollock's paintings catapult him to, um, to celebrity. In 1951, Art News published a list of the top 10 exhibitions from the previous year, from 1950, and Jackson Pollock's shows were the top Three. In fact, when he used to go out drinking in New York City, when he could find his way back and he was going to see his analysts, um, young artists would go up to him and rub him for good luck. They wanted a little bit of what he had. So um, circling back to these photographs, uh, it was during 1950, the summer of 1950, that the photographer Hans uh, Namath, Namath took hundreds of pictures of Pollock at work and then started video recording him as well, um, working outside, uh, creating paint on glass with the camera, looking up through the glass so you can see the paint falling down uh, um, on the glass. But I think that this was somehow very stressful and demanding on Pollock. So once the filming was done, he went right inside his house and had his first drink for um, in two years. So as we're looking at these pictures, which I just love so much, I, you know, I always feel a little bit guilty too, because there's, there's, a, they cause some sort of stress in his life. So he's riddled with self-doubt, he's struggling with alcoholism and now uh, marital problems. Uh, but uh, after, after he returns to drinking, he never really recovers his strength as a painter. And he made very few paintings following uh, the, the early years of the 1950s. So we'll wrap up on this catapult to fame with um, the elephant in the room. How do you become a world renowned famous artist just by me dripping paint on the floor in your bar out in Long Island? Well, the secret to his success was Lee Krasner. Lee Krasner was his champion. And she fervently believed in him as an artistic genius. She supported his sobriety. She was constantly working the phones, calling galleries, critics, museums, journalists, reporters, um, collectors, making sure that his work was being seen, discussed, exhibited. So, um, so we have Lee Krasner to thank in so many ways. Now, we are going to turn our attention to Pollock's uh, tragic demise. Uh, by 1956, Pollock is frustrated, he's anxious, he's drinking all the time, and he is totally creatively blocked. As one friend described it, he was in a death trance. And if you've known anybody who suffered from severe mental health issues or from severe alcohol addiction, you maybe have seen something similar to this. His marriage was falling apart. And he meets a young 26-year-old girl named Ruth Kligman, who you can see over here on the right. Um, 
Lee Krasner decides to set sail for Europe and Ruth Kligman and her friend come out from New York City and they're staying with Pollock in Springs, New York. This photograph was taken by Kligman's friend Edith Metzger on the last day of Pollock's life because that night the three of them go out um, in Pollock's Oldsmobile convertible. Pollock is drinking, he's driving erratically. Edith Metzger begs to be let out of the car and then um, the car is involved in, um, in a single car uh, crash. It goes off the road. Pollock is killed instantly as is tragically Edith, Edith Metzger and Ruth Kligman actually survives. So um, Pollock was just 44 years old when he passed away. And you can sort of think of this as like an alcohol-fueled quasi-suicide. So what does this mean for his, his legacy? How do we understand this? Well, here we have Pollock's grave, which is in Springs, New York. You can see people come and put little rocks on um, his tombstone, which is essentially a big rock itself. Um, he Fit the, he fit the archetype of like the classic tortured artist. He was a little bit like Vincent Van Gogh, right? He never had a great day. He dies tragically young, premature death. You know, what could have been of Jackson Pollock if he um, could have just gotten mentally healthy? Um, so what we do know is that just four months after he passed away, there was a retrospective of his art at the Museum of Modern Art. And then um, even before he passed away, he had become a, a part of the fabric of American life. This is a beer commercial over here on the left uh, from 1952. And look what's on the back wall of Jackson Pollock inspired painting. He, like Picasso, broke the rules and he opened the doors for other artists of um, all succeeding generations to create in different ways. So you no longer just had to paint a canvas on an easel that goes on a wall. You could paint it in any which way you wanted. Um, it didn't have to be on a stretch canvas. It doesn't even have to be hung on the wall. This is a painting uh, by Sam Gilliam that is sort of hung like it's on a clothesline. But artists uh, now are freed to create something that expresses who they are, what their internal life is. And so many artists after Pollock are inspired by him to create something that then audiences can then inhabit and emotionally respond to in the same way. So he essentially changed the entire game with these drip paintings. So now we're going to change our perspective <laughs> and turn our attention to Lee Krasner. We have Lee Krasner to thank for all of this. Um, as one fellow painter referred to um, uh, uh, um, uh, Pollock, he, 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 I think he said that he was Lee Krasner's Frankenstein. She was like kind of propping up the monster the whole time. So she has this incredible um, power and control, particularly after he passes away. So let's turn our attention entirely to Lee Krasner. We see her here as a young girl, probably around the age of eight. She was born Lena Krasner to Ukrainian Jewish immigrant parents. She was the youngest of six and the first one to be born in America. She was born in, um, in 1908 in Brooklyn. So um, so we see her here with one of her sisters. She's the one on the right. And she said, I was brought up to be independent. I made no economic demands on my parents. So in turn, they let me be. I was not pressured by them. I was free to study art. It was the best thing that could have happened to me. So she goes on to pursue a career in the arts and she is laser focused. I, I mean, I, I myself really liked attending school, but Lee Krasner just blew me out of the water. She, I, it would be a long list for me to just uh, rattle off all the different types of schooling she had, all the different kinds of training that she had. She loved to continue learning about art. This is a remarkable self-portrait that she painted around the age of 19. I believe this is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was asked by the National Academy of Design in order to gain entrance into one of their programs to paint a, a self-portrait. She nailed a mirror to a tree in her parents' backyard. At that point, they were living in Long Island. And she paints this self-portrait 
that has this incredible look of determination and self-assurance in that face. And also, you know, a high degree of, of, of uh, criticality, you know, I mean, she's really assessing what she's doing. Uh, apparently the National Academy of Design uh, refused the painting. They refused to believe the, the veracity of it. She said, they took one look at my painting and said, that's a dirty trick you played. Don't ever pretend that you painted outdoors. <laughs> so they might not have believed it, but clearly she's on to something. She goes on to study with several master artists, including Hans Hoffman, where she mostly is focused on creating these neo-cubist um, nudes like we see around here. So um, this is abstraction, but there's not a lot of expression in it yet. There's still a lot of control in, in what she's working on. And she's still continuing to educate herself in the arts all along the way. By the 1930s, the Great Depression, she's waitressing to support herself. And then ultimately, she can't make ends meet that way. So like Jackson Pollock, she also got tied into some of those New Deal programs for artists. And she was specifically employed to help um, in large sketches for murals. So this isn't a mural that she designed, but it's one that she helped to enlarge. She actually met Jackson Pollock briefly at one of these events for artists working in the New Deal. So that brings us to her marriage uh, or meeting Pollock again, really in 1942. Um, and from that moment on until his death, she put his career before her own. Now, while he was working outside that barn, she set up a studio in the house. Her work by default had to be smaller than his. And just by default of, of taking care of him, she was producing probably less than he was too. Um, Krasner's extreme, or I should say extensive knowledge of modern art and techniques helped her to bring Pollock into the fold. She could sort of coach him, do a little, little bit more of this. It's related to this trajectory in art history. Do a little bit more of that. This particular critic is really enthralled by this sort of thing. So she is molding him into the success that he became. Um, and it was all due to this extensive training that she had. And Pollock really felt like he couldn't trust anybody else. It was her taste that really um, helped to guide him. So let's turn our attention to what uh, Krasner was doing. She was the talent in the shadows. So we know she was making those like neo-cubist nudes. This is what she starts producing when the couple moves out to Springs, uh, Long Island. And so we can see that she's moving in the same direction of abstract expressionism. There's a lot more color here. I love this rhythm that's created by these, these black lines these, that seem like such a strong gesture. And my eye always kind of searches them because I'm looking for a star or a letter in there, but they just kind of move your eye around this canvas. And um, and then you kind of pull back and you begin to appreciate these gorgeous colors that just seem to dance across the surface of it. So, um, so I think it's a wonderful composition. It's a beautiful work. And it's something that she was sort of inspired to do because she could see the looseness in what Jackson Pollock was doing. Um, what, he, what he was innovating with was really kind of opening up her practice. Um, some, uh, somebody said, uh, you know, could you, could you talk about the influence that he's had on her work? She said, how could you live with someone without that happening? We'd never sit down and have a big talk about art together. He'd come in and say, I want to see what I've done. And I'd invite him into my studio. So they were just kind of naturally cross-pollinating at this time. So as Pollock is beginning to obscure his images and just starting to, to do drip paintings, we can see in 1947 that Krasner is doing something kind of the same. He is, or she is, I should say, um, creating these densely layered works where you can sort of peek through little sections of the painting and just glimpse what might have been there originally. But then we begin to see this, um, this tracery work, this calligraphy that has been um, densely layered on top. And it's always kind of fun to think, okay, well, did these big, thick, fat black lines come in first or did these delicate uh, white lines come in first? And where is their overlap? and where is their underlap and then I just love the little detail the, of the um, the red and, and the yellow just little splotches that kind of dance around the surface they feel like autumn leaves falling don't they 
So, um, so this is a work that I would say you kind of excavate with your eyes. There's like endless opportunity to appreciate something like this. And then she can go in a completely different direction. This is a work from 1949 called Composition. And with this work, we see this complex sort of grid-like system that she's created using this white paint on top of these beautiful muted colors in the background. And it feels like we're looking at modern or, or, or at modern or ancient glyphs, right? This could be space age. This could be something that, you know, predates humanity. It's hard to understand. Or are we looking at the map of a city? There's this wonderful kind of uh, regimented sense to it. And you feel like you've got it all figured out as your eyes are moving through it. And then she creates these little um, deviations, sort of like Pollock does. Now, interestingly, uh, Pollock and Krasner exhibited in a show called artists, man, and wife in 1949. And a reviewer said, there's a tendency among some of these wives to tidy up their husband's styles. Lee Krasner takes her husband's paint and changes his unrestrained sweeping lines into neat little squares and triangles. I feel like that is not doing her work justice. Now, she eventually goes back to naming her work. She falls in line with Pollock at a certain point. She's just giving her, her uh, she's just numbering her works, but then she begins to name them again. And she never fully gives up on this idea of figuration. So this is a work that's called Bald Eagle from 1955. And maybe you're looking at like something that looks like the beak of a bald eagle over here. Apparently, um, she and her art dealer just had a lot of fun coming up with these names. But I wanted to show you this work in particular because I think it's a great example of her as a collage artist. And this is where she really shines. So um, you can see that she has taken a piece of paper that has all of these little black splotches on it and she's just torn it up and she's layered it on top of what was already a painting. She um, she was like her own worst critic. She would go back to her old works and tear them up and, um, and, and, and reuse them as pieces of collage. So, um, so we can see that happening here too in a work called Shattered Light from 1954. There's a beautiful sweeping gestural oil painting under there. And then she's layered in the tans, the browns, the ochres, the a little bit of blue and a little bit of yellow. And the effect I think is really beautiful. It's this total overall effect. It sort of goes back to Pollock and his mural from 1943. Um, and it also, with this title, I think sort of reminds us of like fragmented light or maybe the, the experience that you have looking up while you're standing in a forest. So um, it seems like a, a sort of a, an emotional experience um, as I think looking at a lot of abstract expressionist art is, but it's also um, maybe sort of referring to experiences in in our, our lived environment. Now, after Pollock's death in 1956, Lee Krasner takes over the barn where he had been working. She uh, does a little renovation in there. She makes it her own. So now she can work on a grander scale. So I love this photograph of her. She looks like a middle-aged woman climbing up this ladder here. She's going to make her giant art the way she wants to make it. And I love just how determined and self-possessed she looks over in this photograph on the right. She looks like a woman that you don't um, that you don't cross. She looks like she really knows that, uh, that she's coming to her own now. Now, the great thing about Krasner is that she is never one thing. Her, her art continually evolves. Maybe she learned a lesson from Pollock in that way. Like you can't just be one thing. So, um, so sometimes in, in the 1960s, she is soft and sort of amorphous. And then by the 1970s with this work called Imperative that's at the National Gallery of Art, she is jagged edges. She's like knife edges. And if you look really closely, she has just um, cut cut up one of her neo-cubist drawings, probably from the 1930s, and has reassembled it in this collage format. But man, it's striking. It's beautiful. I, I, I'm like so drawn to her work. Now, in the interest of time, we will wrap up with Lee Krasner's Death and Legacy. Here's a late photograph of her. 
Um, she uh, passed away in 1984 at the age of 75. So she lived a nice long life after Jackson Pollock. And as her health was declining, there was a retrospective of her work that was traveling around the country. It's, it had started in Texas. And just a few months after she passed away, it, um, it opened at the Museum of Modern Art. And can you believe that up until 2008, she was one of only four women ever to have a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. So that says a lot about her um, and probably, you know, her connections in the art world as well. Now, um, she's seen as a very important figure in the world of abstract expressionism. Her works sell today for anywhere from like a million dollars to $10 million. That sounds like a nice uh, chunk of change, but of course, Pollock's work sell at auction, sometimes for upwards of $200 million. <laughs> so there's a little disconnect there. She was um, uh, she was interred in the same cemetery where Jackson Pollock was. His stone here is obviously much bigger. She's alongside him, but definitely not in his shadow. She had tremendous authority and control over his legacy. She was at the heart of authenticating every drip and splatter painting that emerged in the decades following her husband's death, including one from his uh, mistress, Ruth Kligman, who really wanted her little painting authenticated. It never was. Um, and she also saved his papers her and her own uh, they're in the collection of the Smithsonian. Uh, they, she, her will started a foundation in both of their names to help support um, artists that are struggling financially. And um, her will also turned their house in Springs, New York into a museum and study center. So if you're so inclined, you can take a little boat ride across Long Island Sound and go out and visit the house and go into the barn where they have um, removed uh, the layer of, of flooring that that Lee Krasner had put down after uh, Jackson Pollock's death. And you can see the floor where he painted. I believe you can stand on it. And you can even see the edges of some of his most famous works. And then on the walls, you can see um, flicks of her paint because she was working on the walls throughout um, her entire life. And I think it would be quite the thrill to be there. So we'll wrap up tonight with just uh, one quick conclusion really about these two incredible people. In the end, it's clear that Paul and Krasner could not have become the artists that they were without each other. Pollock benefited from Krasner's support, her knowledge of modern art, and her art world connections that she forged on his behalf. Without Krasner, Pollock could have literally died on the streets of New York City from drinking. She provided the stability. Krasner, in turn, was inspired by Pollock's loose improvisational style, his innovative approach to art making, and that liberated her practice, as it did for so many other people. She stood in his shadow during his lifetime, but her connection to him no doubt helped her for the many decades that she lived beyond him. She protected his legacy. She forged her own along the way. No matter who you think is more deserving of recognition or praise, I hope you come away from tonight's experience with a more complete understanding and appreciation of these two remarkably talented artists. So I will end there for now and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about the program. I'll start looking at the Q&A here. Um, Francine asks, do you know why Jackson Pollock's drip paintings were more successful and famous than Janet Sobel's paintings? That's the $10 million question, Francine. Um, and I think, you know, the all too easy answer is uh, maybe he was a man. <laughs> and uh, and of course he fit this, this new, um, sense of, 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 of a macho tough guy following World War II. I, I think that is all part of it. Obviously, Janet Sobel's paintings were being recognized and being exhibited, but sometimes it's just who you know and who's working on your behalf that makes those differences. Judy, oh, Judy's here tonight. Hi, Judy. Um, she asks, what caused Pollock to become sober from 1948 to 1950? And I think that was really um, Lee Krasner separating him out from his drinking buddies in New York City. I think she worked really hard to help keep him sober. Oh, Mary asks an interesting question. How tall was he? Mary, I haven't really thought about that, so I don't know the answer to that question. 
but from those photographs, he doesn't look like a very tall man, does he? I, I'm guessing he's under six feet tall, but that's an interesting question, particularly when you think about the reach he had with those paintings. Sorry to give you whiplash here, but going back to, you know, something like Autumn Rhythm here, where you don't see a footprint or anything in the margins here. He leaves that space, but he still get, is able to reach and do this all over painting. Mary, that's a great question. Um, sorry, I don't have the answer. Emily asks, I've heard that Pollock considered that the action of painting was the most important thing. If that's right, did he consider selling videos of his work, not the canvases? Fascinating question, Emily. She says, I can't think of the later artist, Stella, who sold directions to create his works as the artworks themselves. Yes, I do believe that was Stella. Yeah, he'd basically like sell a recipe for how to create one of his works. That is... Uh, that's a fascinating um, thread that you pulled here, Emily. Um, and, and it's interesting to think that it was like the stress and the tension of being documented that seems like it drove him to drink again. So I, I think that could have been kind of the, the, um, the element that prevented that, that, that kind of a, uh, direction in his work. But I'll also say that he kind of felt like he was done with this by 1951 or so. And he started to take things in a different direction. And he really kind of felt like a phony for a lot of the time. He, uh, Ruth Kligman said, sometimes he'd be all ego and say things like, there's only three painters, um, Picasso, Matisse, and Pollock. And then other times he would just be like, I'm a fraud. So, um, so he even questioned the validity of these paintings, but he, uh, but I, I'm sure, just like you said, that it, he he felt strongly that it was the action of these paintings that really made them. But he did move on, so it, I, I don't think uh, um, documenting that part was as important to him as we might think it should have been. Um, Alice asks, uh, was he Jewish? That would explain the stones on his grave. Oh, Alice, that's a really good question. I do know that Lee Krasner was. I don't think that Jackson Pollock was. So I, um, I, I didn't know that was part of the Jewish tradition. So thank you for adding that and um, changes the way I, I think of their gravestones. A lot of the time we see artists or musicians gravestones where people kind of bring things and tribute, like people bring uh, Campbell soup cans to Andy Warhol's grave, but I didn't know that the stones uh, piece was, was part of that. So that's beautiful. Uh, thanks for adding that. Donna B says, did Ruth sell enough of her own work to make a living? Um, that's a great question, Donna. I think, um, well, she also managed his estate, so she was still probably selling some of his work along the way. Um, and my sense is that she made a, de a decent living, but um, but I don't know the numbers that she was getting for her work during her lifetime. When I say that paintings are selling for 10 million now, that's those are posthumous prices, but I don't get the sense that she struggled. Uh, that's a great question. I wish I had more info for you. Stephen asks, um, with abstract paintings that don't seem to have a top, bottom, or side, is there a way to determine which end is up? Stephen, I love that question. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, it's at a certain point, these are put in a frame and they're hung a certain way, right? But I think according to the way Pollock painted it. I, I mean, in theory, we should be able to just kind of spin it around and see it from every direction. I love that question, Stephen. Thank you for getting us to think about that issue because I, I feel like I sort of um, alluded to that, but we didn't fully explore that. So the idea that you could really see them from any angle is kind of essential to understanding this. Thank you for asking that. Larry says, um, what's your opinion of the movie with Ed Harris and Marsha Gay Harden? I rewatched that movie, the Pollock movie, um, which was based on uh, um, a, a, a biography that was written about him. And Larry, I gotta admit, I loved the movie. <laughs> if you haven't seen the Pollock movie, and now if you feel like you can't get enough of Pollock, watch the movie. It's I, I think it's amazing. Ed Harris, like full on painting Pollock paintings on canvas, knocked my socks off. Larry said, did, you, did he ever draw first and then paint over the drawing? As far as I know, there were uh, he never prepared his uh, these works in particular like that. Great question. Um, I think we've answered all of these. I think there's some more ch in the chat here. I'm going to see what I can 
excavate in terms of um, questions. And I'm also seeing where everybody's from, which I love, and I'm seeing familiar names. Thank you people for being here. Uh, oh, Noreen says the cotton pickers by Pollock looks like Van Gogh to me. Um, Noreen, I couldn't agree more. So I think there was a little bit of Thomas Hart Benton, but a lot of uh, uh, Van Gogh in that one. Um, let's see. Oh, there was another question about Janet Sobel, and um, and I would say that the influence there is just that he um, that he definitely saw some drip or splatter paintings prior to the, uh, him ever doing them. So I think that was a little bit of an inspiration for him, or a major. Uh, he did credit her for for um, for providing inspiration for that, but probably not enough. Uh, Beverly asked, did he ever paint the background first, beige? Uh, as far as I know, he didn't. Uh, I think these were kind of like untreated canvases and he just started uh, going to work on it. He didn't really seem like somebody who would do a lot of the prep work at a time, right? You just got going. Um, Theodora says, wasn't he considered a charlatan by many? Theodora, absolutely. Um, he himself felt like a fraud or a phony. And I think um, it goes back to that notion that, you know, I think most people today still look at his paintings and think I could paint that or my kid could paint that. I mean, the perfect response to it is, but you haven't, but you, but you didn't. And then there's that other layer of the control that he had in that and the fact that um, you can find fractals in them and that fractals, fractal analysis is still used to authenticate his painting. So I, to me, there is something much bigger going on in them. But yeah, I, I think he, he felt a little bit like a fraud. And I think a lot of people think that maybe he pulled the wool over a lot of people's eyes. <laughs> Margaret, thanks for your kind words. Dee says, well, the initial impression is chaotic. They are pleasantly balanced. I would agree with that, Dee. Uh, Lynn, thank you for your kind words. And Anarchy, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your kind words. I really, really appreciate it. Um, somebody else asked about the movie. Yes, go watch that Pollock movie. I, like I said, I watched it just a few months ago and, and it's, it's, um, it's dark, you know, it's a little depressing, but it's good. Um, what happened with the brother that he came to New York City with? Great question. I, my sense is that I don't know exactly what happened with each and every brother because he did have four of them. But my sense is that they kind of all settled down, like moved to the burbs, um, there are photographs of his family kind of coming together with his mother at the house in Springs. And it seemed like everybody else kind of had a traditional lifestyle. My, I, I don't think he pursued the arts, um, but don't quote me on that. If he did, he's definitely not the more well-known Pollock. Um, did he or Lee ever meet de Kooning? Yes. Um, so all of these are all of these abstract expressionist artists, Karen, were all in the same social circle. They definitely all knew each other. And believe it or not, Ruth Kligman, who he had the affair with, Pollock had the affair with, went on to have an affair with de Kooning. <laughs> so it would you could even make the case that this is like a slightly incestuous so social circle that they had. But they all knew each other. They would all and they were like drinking buddies. Um Maybe that's uh, not being fair to them, but they knew each other. Uh, thank you. I'm just going through some very nice comments. Uh, who was the Renaissance artist in the opening slide? Ooh, if this image looks familiar to you, you might've seen it at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. The artist is Pierre Matteo D'Amelia. That's his enunciation. And um, fun fact, Pierre Matteo D'Amelia actually painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling before Michelangelo. Um, Let's see here. Oh, Google says that Pollock was 5'7". All right, that gives us some insight into what his wingspan might have been like too. Um, was Lee Krasner similarly exposed to Picasso? Maybe at the same exhibit? Oh, really interesting question, Mishi. And I'm not sure about that. You know, it's really interesting because in the biographies that I've, um, that I've gone through, they really focus on her training and not so much like what was the influence, what were the influences that that would have uh, uh, 
influenced her. I mean, I think for the most part, people are just thinking, okay, she had this training and then everything kind of loosened up because of, uh, of Pollock. But when it comes to Pollock, I mean, it's everything. It's like, he saw the Grand Canyon. He's going to create big paintings. He saw Native Americans doing like sand drip paintings. He's going to paint on the floor. It's like everything that he saw is infused in those works, but that could just be art historians trying to give this a little bit more gravitas. Could be. Um, Lee Krasner probably went to her own fair share of, of um, museum exhibitions too. Um, yes, and Kathleen, I would agree. Lee, Lee Krasner is getting a lot more respect in recent years. There was the big retrospective at um, the Barbican Center in London in 2019. And I, I think, you know, really since the Me Too movement, there's so many curators and art historians that really want to focus on the untold stories of, of women artists. And, and Lee Krasner is somebody who's like just on the periphery, really. I mean, that's not even fair to say. She was she was at the center, but at uh, the edge of the center. <laughs> so um, it's still a story that needs to be fully told. Um, oh, and Lita adds that Jackson Pollock was raised agnostic, but his parents were Presbyterian. Thank you for adding that. During the pandemic, one of the libraries had a tour of his house. Oh, that's very cool. I would have loved to have seen that. Um, mathematicians say you can find structure and randomness. So Pollock could have done, could have just done whatever came out. Stephen, thanks for adding that. That's really interesting. So, you know, I put so much weight on those fractals, but it could be sort of like, 10,000 monkeys working on 10,000 typewriters kind of thing and Hamlet comes out. Um, again, thank you for the very kind words that people have been sharing. I really appreciate that. And um, Joan, thanks for adding that we're going, that I'll be back next month for another art talk on a very different subject, but I hope to see you on Thursday, November 16th. And um, oh, Robin says, what is the point of the tree being the, the uh, centerpiece here? That is the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, as far as I understand, um, or at least that's what they told us when I trained to be a docent at the uh, <laughs> at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I think I answered everything. Um, great questions, everybody. I just love them, and I appreciate all of you. Thank you for sticking around for the Q and A, and I can't wait to see you next month. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Have a great night, everybody. Take care.